Good morning. Welcome to worship for those who have gathered here in the sanctuary and those who are also joining us uh, online by means of technology. We are so glad that you have chosen this day to worship with us. And so I just challenge you, let us set aside the distractions of the morning, the distractions and worries of the week. And let's just hear the words of Psalm 95.6. And let us draw us in today. And Psalm 95.6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us pray. Holy God, we come this day, and in our hearts we bow before you. And we offer to you the sacrifice of praise. May all that is said and done, may the songs we sing, may your word that is proclaimed, may our prayers and the attitudes of our heart, may they be acceptable in your sight, God. And may they bring you honor and glory and praise for you alone are worthy. We offer ourselves to you. Speak for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join me for our opening hymn, uh, To God Be the Glory. The words will be found on the screen. Oh. 
invite you to join me in this morning's affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, you'll find on the screens. What better way to come together this morning and unite our voices all throughout the, uh, the church with the Apostolic Creed. So this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God is good all the time. time. Where have you seen God since last we gathered? Where have you seen his shepherding hand? Thank you, Teo. Thank you, Carol. Any special requests for, for prayer this morning? Joyce Young. Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you. Hmm. Any others? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That name again? Yes, yes, Amy's, Amy's father. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, if there are no other quests right now, uh, Rob's going to come and lead us in a prayer chorus. Majesty.
Let us pray. Father, you are good all the time. We affirm this truth, but we also acknowledge that these are desperate times. May we be desperate enough to do what is good and right to do at all times, and that is to seek you with all our heart, to look to you, to listen to you, to hear you, to say yes to you, though it costs us everything. You are looking for those whose hearts are whole toward you, wholly given to you, that you may give them strong support. May that be us, O oh Lord. Because of your support, because of your empowering presence, we are bold to pray with confidence for all those in authority and the government of this nation and the nations of the world for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, our friends, neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, and for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. God, we pray for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, and for those who minister to them, and to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. We continue to pray for those infected with and affected by the coronavirus. We pray for their friends, their families, and those caring for them. And God, we thank you for the vaccines that are now available. And we pray that uh, they might be effective in immunization and that their side effects might be minimal. We likewise continue to pray for those who are affected by all the fallout of uh, COVID, the economic and, and social consequences, God, those who've lost jobs, those who've lost businesses. Uh, Lord, uh, we just ask for your mercy. And God, we continue to pray for the peace and unity of your church and for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. Lord, may you give us discernment, Lord, that we might know the truth, we might embrace the truth. And, oh God, that we, might, uh, uh, that we might recognize lies and reject them, Lord. Your truth, oh God, sets us free. God, we continue to pray for this congregation and for the special and needs, needs and concerns of those voiced this morning, uh, those on our prayer list, we continue to pray for those shut in and in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, especially the folks at Wesley Meadows. We pray also for our police, fire, and emergency personnel, and for all those serving in the military. God, we declare that your blessing and your loving kindness is upon those who put their trust in you. Let us now pray in the words that our Savior Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time, I invite the boys and girls down front from the moments mostly for kids with Miss Chris. Come on, Vic. I see you sneaking up the side. While we're waiting on our friends to join us here in the sanctuary, I want to make sure that I speak to those children that are joining us online. We're glad you're here, and we are so glad that we have technology like cameras that invites everybody in to hear our moments for kids. Come on. Come on. You're going to want to hear this one. I brought a bag with me today, and inside this bag there are three clues as to what I might be talking about, okay? We're going to see how good your um, investigative skills are today, okay? So today we're going to be talking about something really, really special, and I brought some things. What is this? It's a, it's a napkin or a paper towel, yep. It's not a special one though, isn't it? You might use it at something special. The next thing I have is this. What is this? 
It's a what? It's a candle. Where would you might see this candle on top of a, a, a cake? Hmm. Now, the last thing that's in my little thing, in my bag, are these really cool shades. Can y'all read what they say? Happy birthday. So if we put these three things together, can you think about what we might be talking about? About happy birthdays. We're absolutely talking about happy birthdays today because I happen to know that tomorrow is a super, super special day. Does anybody know what tomorrow is? Well, it might be a snow day, so that's exciting. But the second thing is, tomorrow is my birthday. <laughs> and I love to celebrate my birthday. I really do, it's a super fun day. And you guys have fun times on your birthday. Do you have a party? Yeah, before COVID, we got to have a party, didn't we? Well, you know, I'm gonna have a party tonight and I'm gonna celebrate. And we're celebrating the day that I came into this world, January the 11th, right? It's a special day. But do you know, as followers of Jesus, we get to celebrate two birthdays? Not only do you get to celebrate the day that you came into this world, but as followers of Jesus, we get to celebrate a re-birthday. The Bible tells us if we ask Jesus into our hearts to be our Savior and to save us from our sins, that we are born again. So I celebrate my birthday where I came into my family on January the 11th. But on December the 15th, 1991, when I was in the fifth grade, I prayed a very special prayer, and I prayed that Jesus would be my forever friend and save me from my sins. So on that day, I celebrate my rebirth day. And did you know that the Bible tells us that when one person comes into the family of God and is reborn through Jesus, that all of heaven rejoices? So we're going to have a birthday party tonight for Miss Chris, and it's going to be a lot of fun. But can you imagine what the party is like in heaven when someone is born into the family of Christ? That's a big celebration, isn't it? Let's say a prayer, okay? Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for sending Jesus that would save us from our sins so that we could celebrate again a rebirth in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can remain seated for all creatures of our God and King. The words will be found on the screen.
going to ask that you stand for our scripture reading this morning, which comes from Psalm chapter 8. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Now the mouth of babes and infants, you have found a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion of the works of your hands, and you have put all things under their feet all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. faithfulness. 
It's not just a song, uh, it's not just a thought, but it is the very statement of the nature and character of who God is, that he is faithful. And in these days of uncertainty, uh, we know that God is certain. This morning we begin a look at Psalm chapter 8. And uh, as we do this this morning, this will be part of a series that uh, we'll be doing for the next couple of weeks, uh, titled Long Story, Short Story. And I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But let me ask you first, did anybody make any New Year's resolutions? Second Sunday of the uh, new year, and it's always customary. We, if we don't make resolutions, we certainly think about them and feel like we uh, are somehow obligated uh, to do so. Uh, just about everybody has some thought about, uh, I'm going to exercise more this year, I'm going to eat uh, more healthy, uh, I'm going to save more money. Maybe uh, one of the New Year's resolutions is to travel and uh, go different places and uh, see some sites that you hadn't seen or uh, certainly to uh, meet with family and friends as soon as, as possible. Maybe it's uh, to read more. Now, as Christians, we also have certainly uh, New Year's resolutions, and maybe it's to pray more, maybe it's to serve more, maybe it's to read our Bible more. I thought it was interesting that the American Bible Society and their annual state of the Bible, looking back to 2019, uh, have surveyed and discovered that only 9% of Americans say they read their Bible every day. We can certainly have some room for improvement there. There's certainly the need for improving our exposure to God's Word. And so for believers, we may have an emphasis on improving our prayer life, uh, again, our opportunity to serve, but uh, hopefully we've all got an opportunity and, and desire to increase our exposure to God's Word. Now, as you start out at the beginning of a new year to read the Bible through, then we've all experienced the excitement of Genesis and Exodus, and somewhere when Leviticus rolls in, there's a little bit of uh, uh, zapping of the joy as the hurdles and obstacles are in front of us. And then by the times it, time that we hit numbers, uh, there's just a slide, and, and after reading several chapters, we kind of, well, I'll do this next time, or there's a real uh, desire to find something new. But I want to encourage you that uh, there are all kinds of Bible reading plans that are available and some that will break down the Old Testament and combine that with the New uh, to help uh, give guidance and direction there. But there are plenty of reasons that there is an obstacle to our exposure to the Word, God's Word. And that is, in addition to maybe not taking time, we feel like, I don't know where to start. Or, I'm not sure uh, what it means, it seems so confusing. Or, when I read about Israel, I thought Israel only became a nation in 1948 after World War II. And, and how, does all, how do all these things relate? Well, for the next uh, several weeks, we're going to be addressing uh, these major themes in Scripture. And uh, it's under the emphasis of the long story short. It's uh, using a book by that name. Uh, that really helps to, to break down uh, the major biblical uh, aspects into six major themes. And so what it seeks to do is to give uh, the, the new reader uh, handholds by which to process the, the information that we're reading. Uh, but for someone who is uh, quite versed in reading, I think they will also benefit as well. So next week, we'll begin looking at the fall of humanity, followed by Israel. What is Israel? Who is Israel? then Jesus, then the church, and then new creation. And so that'll lead us all the way up to Lent in preparation for Easter. But today, we begin with an emphasis on creation. That's what Psalm chapter 8 is about. It's a creation psalm. Now, there are a couple things I want to share just uh, as we get started in terms of clarifying statements. Uh, is that we're not going to settle the debate about whether the earth uh, is of a young age, uh, less than 10,000 years, or whether it's of an old age. Of whether a day is a 24-hour period in terms of creation, or does it represent an era uh, of time. Well, we know that the fossil record, uh, if it's accurate, does indicate uh, dates longer than 10,000 years old. But what we have to recognize, too, is this, if humans are not as old as the fossil record, then the fossil record gives to us uh, an account that there was death and that there was destruction before 
the fall of humanity in sin. So there continues to be an ongoing debate about how creation came about. But what we want to begin with this morning is what is very clear is that who brought about creation, there is no doubt about that. That God is the very author of creation. And while there may be a change in the species, uh, what we do not have a record of is one species evolving into another type of animal. Uh, That's called the missing link. And secular scientists are continuing to search for that missing link that shows that evolution is a fact. But we discover and see in Scripture that Scripture is not supportive of any kind of an evolutionary thought in that way. Scripture affirms the creation of the universe by a creator, and his name is God. It's not an accident. Uh, Humans uh, are not some part of primordial uh, ooze that just uh, occurred on the scene. Um, even though the fossil record is used by the secular creation, creationist who would say that somehow creation came about, but we're going to leave God out of the equation. You just can't do that, and Scripture does not allow for us to do that. For God created. Where there was chaos, God brought order. Where there was darkness, God brought light. And God gives life in and of himself. So that's where we begin this morning. Now, it's probably going to happen as we meet here today that uh, there'll be a plane that'll fly over, maybe more than one. And uh, you've heard me talk about just my fascination with aircraft and just uh, how something that big and that heavy uh, can remain aloft and how it can overcome uh, the forces of gravity. Uh, To me, that's just an amazing thing. But what's even more amazing when you consider that uh, one of those big airplanes that flies over uh, is composed of over three million parts. They didn't happen by chance, but those three million parts are coordinated, they are working together, uh, they are making flight possible. It's amazing. Then if you drive north on Highway 51 just out of town, uh, once you drive past I-69, you'll notice to your left there this incredibly large structure that is being built, this uh, distribution center. And when you look over and you see, if you haven't traveled that way very often, it's, you know, it's kind of one of those things you drive by there, well, they're moving some dirt today, and then a few weeks later, well, they're they're putting up a few steel girders, and now you go by and there's just this huge building that's still not complete. But it testifies to us that it didn't happen just overnight. It testifies to us that it didn't happen by accident, but that it was by plan, by design, by intelligence design. The same thing happens or ought to happen when we consider our very own bodies and when we look at our hands and we see that each finger has a distinct and unique fingerprint. That there may be similarities to people in the, in the, around the world but there's no, uh, nobody else has the same fingerprint that you have. And so it means that you are a special creation of God. That you are are planned in the mind of God. Uh, They tell us that if you took all the blood vessels of uh, a human body and you strung them end to end, that it would circle the globe four times at the equator. That's amazing. That is truly incredible. And then when we think about how an average lifespan, over an average lifespan, the human heart will beat somewhere more than three billion times. You see, God has put us together. God has made us because he is our creator and there is a plan that he has established. That's why we have creation and that's why we have order. Now, what the scripture gives to us is an account of creation that is very unlike the creation accounts of the ancient Near East. Say, for instance, the Babylonians who have a creation story that comes about as a result of the conflicts of the gods warring with each other and that humanity and the world in which we enjoy are really just the leftover pieces of those gods who didn't win out. But we don't believe that. We believe that scripture gives to us a worldview that tells us where we came from, who our creator is, It tells us the problem of our creation, which we will address next week. 
But then scripture also tells us about the hope of the future in which we are headed because God has created us and God gives us those answers. Now, more than ever, it seems that we need to be aware and be mindful that we were created with the intention of God, the purpose of God, and to know that you are desired and that God created each one of us out of an act of love and that therefore we are unique being created in his image. God is good and God is good all the time. So this morning, we talk about the long story short, and we're talking, obviously, about creation. First of all, creation means that there is reason to worship. In Psalm chapter 8, David begins by saying, O Lord, our Lord, our sovereign Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. In other words, when he thinks about the name of God, It's not just a a meaningless name, but that name of God speaks about the very character and nature of God. And and in saying what David says in Psalm 8, he has no issue whatsoever with Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Lord is like no other. And what David is trying to convey to us is this sense of awe that takes, uh, uh, requires us to recognize that God is greater than we can ever, ever imagine. Now, I don't know if you've noticed the the background of our screens today. Uh, That's not just a plain blue screen, but that is actually a photograph. A 1990 photograph taken by the spaceship uh, Voyager, the Explorer, And as it was heading out of our solar system, they programmed it to turn around, being 3.7 billion miles from the sun, and to take a picture. And the name of this slide is called the Pale Blue Dot. And so if you'll see in the line on the right-hand side, uh, look above the E in reason, and there is just this tiny blue dot. That's us. That's where we are. And so when you see this picture, there are a number of other pictures that you can also search out that show our solar system that give to us this image of who God is in his greatness. Now we tend to think of the heavens uh, and the place where God lives as just up there somewhere high above in the sky. But David says God's glory is above the heavens. It's beyond what we can see. So even if we were to travel 3.7 billion miles into outer space, what we would continue to see is God's creation. And David, in his own way, is saying to us that God's glory is even beyond the universe in which we can see in the solar system in which we live. That it is a sign of his David goes on to say that out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now if you've got a little one in your house right now, whenever they cry, you're probably not thinking those kinds of thoughts. But it's as though David is saying that as great as God is, God can send a child to speak the wisdom of that will give insight that will stand against the enemies. And and I can't help but think of the child whose birth we have just celebrated, that Jesus, the very Son of God, in the form of humanity, dwelt among us and spoke to us the truth of God. David says, when I go outside and I look up at night, remember he's a shepherd. And so he's on the hillside. There, there's, there's obviously no street lights around. There's no lights from the city. He says, when I see the moon and when I see the stars, when I see the work of your fingers, what in the world are human beings that you're even mindful of them? You know, sometimes we're only concerned about the upper atmosphere in terms of what's the weather going to do. And we don't take time to recognize 
that God's glory is even beyond what we can see above. He says, you are made a little lower than the angels, and you are crowned with glory. And certainly what he is implying there is that as we are creation, created in the image of God, God's glory rests upon us. And so that when we see one another, we need to see beyond just the physical appearance. But recognize that that individual, that human being, regardless of their age, regardless of their political persuasion, regardless of where they are theologically, that person is a person of worth. And that person represents the glory of God simply by their creation. It's about worship. Secondly, creation is a reason to hope. As we talk about the long story short, why is it that creation is important in the first place? It's because it tells us where we've come from. It tells us of our origin. It tells us of our identity. So you and I can, can take a break and, and stop feeling like we've got to, to bolster up our image in order to gain confidence about our self-image. Our self-image is to be drawn from the fact that you and I are creations of God. And simply because of that fact, there's reason to hope. Now, in the book, Long Story Short, the author, Josh McNall, uh, takes an opportunity to focus on Job. Job is that Old Testament character that we often refer to whenever we're going through a tough time. How are you doing today? Well, I'm, I'm right there with Job, struggling. And remember the story of Job? Job was one who followed the Lord. God had blessed him with livestock and, and animals. God had blessed him with a family. And one day, the devil came to God and said, You know the only reason that your servant Job uh, worships you is because you've been good to him. It's because he's got lots of worldly things. He's got wealth. He's got a big family. And the devil said, That's the only reason he worships you, because you give him stuff. And the Lord said, That's not the Job that I know. Tell you what. You can take away what he has near him that he loves and values. Only don't take his life, and you'll see. And what happens with Job is that these warring factions come in, and they take away all of his cattle, all of his possessions. A storm sweeps through, and as a result, his family, they're all killed. And Job is afflicted with boils. And he wonders, what have I done? Job's wife isn't very sympathetic. She just finally comes to him in all of his grief and suffering and says, Job, it looks pretty bad for you, buddy. Why don't you just cuss God and die? But Job wouldn't do that because he knows that God is faithful. And then Job, the book of Job tells us about these three friends who are concerned about Job, and they come to be with him. And it says for days they sit there and they don't say a word. They sit there in the, in the dirt and in the ashes trying to connect with Job and empathize with him. And, you know, it needs to be a reminder that you and I, when we go to visit with somebody, we don't necessarily feel like if they're going through a tough time or for grief, sometimes there's just no magic words that you and I can say. Simply it's just the ministry of presence. But that soon comes to an end for these three friends, and so they begin to open their mouths, and they begin to tell Job, Job, the reason you're suffering like you are is because you've got sin in your life. And Job, if you'll just confess, if you'll just repent, then, then, then God will bring restoration to your life. And, and Job listens to their, their plight, he listens to their story, but Job says, I haven't done it. And Job stands in defiance of their request that he has sinned. Now, at some point, Job has had enough, and towards the end of the book, he begins to rail against God and begins to question God and begins to challenge God as to why he's experienced what he has experienced. And, and God allows him to say his peace, <clears throat> but then God speaks. <laughs> now, woe Nelly, because God speaks. 
and he gets Job's attention. And he says, Job, where were you when the foundations of the earth were formed? Job, where were you when the springs that gave forth to all the waters of the earth gave forth water? Job, where were you when the storehouses of lightning, of rain, and thunder, and hail, and snow were established? Job, where were you? And there's just silence from Job. And it seems like God is being awfully uncaring and awfully unkind. And then in Job chapter 38, God says this, Job, do you know that at creation, do you know at the creation of all that there is, that the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And again, that can seem like, God, you're not very considerate or empathetic. But what God is doing in the midst of Job's pain, in the midst of Job's questioning why, God is reminding Job that the creation, the creation alone is enough to cause us to worship and we realize that that is the reason that you and I have life and breath in our lungs is to praise God. And now it doesn't diminish the struggles that we face in life, but we will discover that we can find a way through that God will walk with us as we praise God. I like what Josh McNall says. He says, perhaps this has something to do with the way that the story starts. That God is trying to give Job this sense of hope in the way that it will end. You see, the creation story is a reason to hope. It tells us where we come from, what's gone wrong, and tells us where we're headed. And where we're headed is a reason for hope. And then third, creation gives to us a reason to live. We were created from the community that God enjoys amongst the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Created from community, created for community. In Genesis chapter 1, we read that God said, let us make man in our image. That there was a sense of collectiveness, there was a sense of community of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that creation came about not because God was bored, not because he's just an old man sitting in a rocking chair and just trying to figure out what am I going to do to entertain myself today. No, you and I are part of creation because it is an expression of the love of God. And the love that God shares together in the Trinity is that of community. And you and I were created male and female for the purposes and the glory of God. And whenever we meet together, it says, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I also. One of the things that we've experienced, all of us, in this time of COVID is the struggle with isolation. And we recognize even more that you and I were created to be together with others. And when we are together, God's glory is present. But unless we're gathered together with that understanding, then we think it's just about the group that's gotten together and, and these connections and these relationships. There is something that is glorious that happens when we come together. And if our eyes are not on Christ, it becomes, uh, can become an occasion for idolatry. But what we are is the expression of God's love. We see it in the news. doesn't matter which channel you watch. It's not just in the United States. We see it around the world that humanity is out of control, that humanity has gone off the rails, trying to find values and things that make sense to the individual, but yet ignoring the very will of God. And we wonder why we have trouble. 
we wonder why we have chaos. We were created for community. Community with the very Spirit of God and community with the body of Christ. I saw this little cartoon of Calvin and Hobbes that I reposted on uh, my Facebook page this week. And Calvin and Hobbes is a cartoon character. Calvin is this little Dennis the Menace kind of uh, trouble-causing uh, little kid. And uh, Hobbes is his little stuffed teddy bear. But whenever uh, uh, Calvin speaks to Hobbes, uh, Hobbes becomes kind of this uh, life-size figure and is tall as Calvin. And in this particular cartoon, uh, Calvin and Hobbes are standing, obviously, out uh, in the night and the evening, looking up at the night sky. And Calvin says to Hobbes, he says, If people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I'll bet they'd live a lot differently. Now, there is a naturalistic kind of bent to that. We just don't walk outside and say, oh, God did that without God first touching our hearts and awakening us to his creation and his greatness and who he is. But that's true. We need to remember that God's glory is above and beyond what we can see. But the sun, the moon, and the stars are testaments to his handiwork. The person sitting to our left or to our right is a testament of God's creative power and creating in his image. In Psalm 8, he says, When I look at your heavens, I see your majesty that you have shared with us. He goes on to say, you've given us dominion over the land, over the beast of the field, and the birds of the air. Saying that God has invited us to share in the stewardship of his very creation. And it's not stewardship in isolation from God, but it's in partnership and relationship with God. I like what Max Lucado says. He reminds us, you weren't an accident. You weren't mass-produced. You aren't an assembly line product. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly, lovingly positioned on the earth by the master craftsman. Long story short is, creation is God's thumbprint, telling us that you and I have value because he has assigned it to us. He has assigned to us the opportunity to gather together in community. And I want to challenge you that as we begin this new year, that you would consider not only just engaging in a new reading of the Bible and reading of Scripture this year, because again, like Ann Esther always said, you can't ever graduate from Sunday school and learning. But we do need a continual transformation and changing. Now, there are any number of reading plans that you can find uh, to be involved in. I encourage you to search those out. But I want to invite you to go a step further, that you would engage prayerfully and that you would be willing to meet together with some other folks just to read through the Bible together. Now, I know that the COVID is making things kind of challenging. Maybe there are folks in your household, your family can do this. Certainly encourage that. Uh, maybe there's opportunity to use, and certainly there is opportunity to use uh, technology. It's not the most convenient sometimes. It doesn't always work. It's not the same as being together in uh, the physical presence of another, but it's an opportunity still to draw upon the grace of God, to do a Bible study, be willing to circle together even as the Methodist Church here talks about our life groups because we're made for community it's from community for which we from which we were created and we are made for community together and in these changing times we're thankful that God does not change but we need each other to be reminded we need each other as instruments of God's grace to live the life that he's called us to live. Long story short, creation is vital to helping us to understand who we are in Christ. Let's pray together. 
Oh, Lord, we bow before you this morning, giving you thanks that we are not an accident. Lord, we thank you for your love that shows intention and plan and design for creating for us life, but not just to live life in this world, but to live life in this world with our eyes and attention and our heart captivated by you, our creator. Lord, we thank you that you've done everything that's needed to give us life in this world and that you've done everything needed for life beyond this world by sending your son Jesus to die for us. Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that is ours. Thank you for the new beginning that is possible in and only through Christ. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. In the name of Christ, we pray. And everyone together said, couldn't think of a better way to close out our service today than with the hymn how great thou art and may that be an expression of our hearts saying God how great you are and what a great opportunity for me to yield to you and perhaps if there's someone here who's never said Lord I need you as the savior of my life that today would be that day to say Lord how great you are thank you for your love and forgiveness make your confession to God Turn from your sin, and he grants your forgiveness and salvation. And then, as always, as we step into a new year, God doesn't want us to be the same person that we were last year, not even the same person last week, not even the same person as yesterday. And the only way that can happen is by stepping forward and saying, Lord, here I am again. Take me, make me what you long to have me be by the power of your spirit. You pray that prayer, and God will answer as always, there's an opportunity for us to gather at the altar. May we stand together and sing. The words will be on the screen.
I would invite you to look at the cross and receive this blessing and benediction. As you go from this place, go with the certainty and knowledge of God's love for you. And that as you venture into God's creation, knowing that we ourselves are created in his image, go in his strength, love, and power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ we pray. And everyone together said,